it's my privilege to kind of be the uh, facilitator of this evening's program um, I'm, and to introduce our, our speaker, filmmaker, journalist, and Pulitzer Prize winning uh, author Douglas Blackman. Uh, let me tell you how the evening's going to go, how it's going to uh, roll out. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our speaker and then we'll get a sneak peek at uh, a film that he's uh, working on now called The Harvest. It will be out uh, uh, at the end of this year. Um, the Harvest examines the transformation of America with regard to race from the 60s to the present day through the lens of one small Mississippi town, Doug's hometown of Leland, Mississippi. After watching the clips, um, we're going to, uh, he and I are going to have a, a, a brief conversation and then we will bring you, the audience, into that uh, conversation. Okay? So that's, that's what we have in store for uh, you today. Um, Douglas Blackman has uh, written extensively over the last 25 years and longer about uh, race in America, among other things. He uh, was for 29 years the host and executive producer of American Forum. No, uh, only six. Not 29. I'm not that old. I can't have been only old. Only 26. Yeah, that's, that's all right. All right. All right. He can read. Uh, it, it's a public affairs program broadcast weekly uh, on PBS stations around the country. Uh, he was bureau chief and senior national correspondent at the Wall Street Journal in Atlanta, where he wrote about or directed coverage about, among other important topics, uh, the election of President Obama the rise of the Tea Party movement, and the BP oil spill. He is the author of Slavery by Another Name, the re-enslavement re of black Americans from the Civil War to World War II, which won the Pulitzer Prize for general nonfiction in 2009. He also produced the blockbuster PBS documentary with the same title, Slavery by Another Name. I encourage you to go to pbs.org and watch the film and read the book. The book and the film tell a story how, after the Civil War and the end of Reconstruction, a large and widespread system of forced labor was established across much of the South, in which tens of thousands of African American men were arrested for vagrancy, jaywalking, or simply trumped up charges, uh, were uh, brought to trial, which uh, were succinct, um, found guilty and often sentenced or, or, or fined $100, which they couldn't pay. And so they were uh, um, sold, was the word that was used, right? Correct. To uh, corporate interests, corporate companies, uh, to do work for them, forced labor. Some of them were on um, plantations, some were on um, uh, lumber outfits, and some were in um, uh, mines that were of extraordinary, uh, horrific uh, conditions. Um, they had no rights, they had no recourse, they had very little value to those who had rented them until um, uh, their debt was paid off or they died, and so many of them did, in fact, die. The story disabuses us of the notion that slavery ended with the Civil War and the 13th Amendment. Um, I think we, our country could uh, uh, benefit from knowing more about Jim Crow, uh, not to mention uh, slavery by another name. Um, we're going to tee up the uh, um, film a little bit, Doug, if you would, please. Um, the first thing we're going to see is some music and some old film. Tell us about that. Sure, and, uh, and thanks for having me, by the way, and I'm, I'm glad to... Uh, if I had just come the last time when I was scheduled, I obviously would have brought with me the weather that I brought today. Uh, so I apologize uh, for that, for not being brave enough to bring you that weather. But, uh, but, but thank you for having me back, uh, and, and Peter, thanks for arranging all of this. Um, before I say anything about the film, I have to say one other thing, and, and that there's at least one other filmmaker uh, in the room, but any artist uh, can understand what I'm about to say, and that is to apologize in advance that this is not the film 
This is these are these are bits of the film that you're going to see, uh, and uh, it's the most terrifying thing for anybody who works on this kind of creative work to show something that's not finished. Uh, uh, so you, I have to tell you in advance of any flaws that you see, or, you know, weird jumps between this or that, you know. That's all because it's an unfinished film and you have to forgive me uh, for an advance. But one of the reasons we're doing this is that we're still making the film uh, and we've learned something from these kinds of conversations uh, of what people respond to. So you're also sort of a test audience, I'll say. Uh, but what you're going to see here is um, all comes from the first act of the film. And the film's really in three acts. And it is about this one little town in Mississippi. Uh, all of the events occur there. There'll be some other voices in the film that are not uh, from that one place. But the story of the film is really what happens in this one place over 50 years uh, as seen through the eyes of a group of children, of which I'm one, uh, who were born in the summer or fall of 1964 uh, during, and so and in the Mississippi Delta. Uh, and so at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, the, this sort of enormous event of the Civil Rights Movement, some of you may well recall, and those of you who are students here may have never heard of, uh, but, the, uh, but this, this pinnacle moment of the Civil Rights Movement, uh, this group of kids who, having nothing to do with that, are born uh, in 1964, and then in 1970, uh, we end up being the, in the first class of children in Mississippi uh, to begin the first day of first grade black and white together and go all 12 grades. Um, and so this is a look at what happens over 50 years in this place uh, through the eyes of that group of children. Uh, and so the, in the first act, which you'll see here, is really about what happened in the 60s uh, and you know, those, those original events. And I should say, uh, just to identify, we, at the very beginning of the film, you're going to see some black and white footage uh, from a documentary film that was made in 1965. Uh, by, as it turns out, uh, 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 by two filmmakers, one of whom happens to be here with us tonight, uh, uh, sitting on the front row over here, uh, uh, Tom Griffin. Uh, and so as a young man, he and, uh, and his filmmaking partner, John Douglas, um, who couldn't be here tonight, um, and he and I have never met before. We've talked on the phone, but tonight's the first time we've met. Uh, and, uh, but they came out and uh, made a film about uh, a place right outside the town that I grew up in where a group of black farm workers went on strike in the spring of 1965 against the plantation uh, owner and the, and the place where they lived on this plantation and they were all evicted from their homes uh, and they ended up setting up a tent encampment that then became a permanent place known as Strike City. Uh, and, uh, and so the film that, that Tom made uh, is called Strike City. And so you'll see a little bit of it at the beginning of this uh, and, uh, and then the story will, uh, will unfold a little bit uh, of what happens then in those, in those early years, uh, the 1960s. And then just very briefly, I'll say in the second act, the, the, the first act, you won't see this, uh, but in the first act, it all ends pretty triumphantly. It, it could be a film by itself uh, that it turns out that in this little town in Mississippi, like in a lot of places in America, uh, there seemed to be a great victory uh, that you know, the schools were in fact integrated and some white people stayed in the system. Most did not. Most whites fled public schools and never came back. But, uh, but some stayed, like my family. And also, I should mention, my father happens to be here tonight as well, who's also on the front row, who now lives in Troy, New York. And he's not in the film, but my mother is, uh, and the, in what you'll see tonight. But, the, uh, uh, but there were white Southerners who, who, uh, who stuck with public schools. Uh, and, and so in this little town, somewhat improbably, uh, there was a success uh, uh, in this place. And I ended up uh, going to schools that were of mixed race and all the way through. And I, I and the other white kids there certainly benefited enormously from that. And I think most of the black kids did too, though that's a, that's a debatable question. Um, but the, and so the film could stop right there and it would be a triumphant story of how a little town did the right thing in a difficult time. But the story doesn't stop there, and the, in, the, in the second act is how it all falls apart, as it has pretty much everywhere in America. You know, there, there really are almost no places in our country where there is a substantially diverse population. Uh, you know, it, um, almost no place in the country where, if there is a su substantial black population, where you have a, a genuinely integrated, successful public school system. We really have not figured out how to do that, even still today, pretty much anywhere in America. There, Probably a few exceptions to that. Uh, but so the second act is how it all falls apart uh, and culminates actually with uh, a, a sort of Ferguson, Missouri type incident that happens in the town, happened in the town in 1996, 
where there's a police stop between a white police officer and a black man and uh, that ends and at the end of it the black guy's dead uh, and the uh, uh, and the police officer was not one of my classmates but was a white kid a couple of years ahead of me in school and so for all intents and purposes uh, had gone through the same experience that you know that, that my class had uh, and and after that incident occurs in 1996 there is uh, civil unrest in the town part of the downtown is burned uh, and the uh, and it goes on for several days until the governor of Mississippi sends in the state police and declares martial law. And so essentially at that point in 1996, uh, whatever triumph uh, it seem, seemed to have been accomplished uh, by 1970 has, seems to have evaporated. Uh, and then in the third act, it, all, it comes into the present. Uh, and among those kids that I went to school with, you now have uh, among them are the, the police chief, the current police chief, the current president of the school board, another member of the school board, the municipal court judge, uh, and, and it's, it's, a, it's so it's a kind of statistical improbability that uh, that so many of those would happen to come from this particular group of kids, but they do, uh, and uh, and they're now for the first time in a very long time there is some conversation happening in that in that community, uh, asking, is this really how things should have turned out? You know, the, the way that things are now is it really how things should have turned out? Because there basically have been no white children in the in the public school system in that community. Uh, uh, other than a, just a tiny number who've come through, but essentially there have been no whites in, involved in public education now for more than 20 years. Uh, and, uh, and so there is now finally the and, the, and the people at the end, and you'll see a few of them in a little montage at the beginning, uh, near the beginning of this, but uh, they are still as flawed as all, you know, all, all of us are quite flawed. And, and so even their dialogue today has its own flaws. There's by, by no means is everything marching to uh, a, a, a nice, neat uh, uh, victory at the end, but there is a discussion going on uh, for the first time in uh, in many decades. So, so we're going to start by seeing some interviews with those uh, people. They're no longer children, um, but you'll we'll hear from some of your classmates, right? Uh, both black and white, and some teachers, right? Uh, and uh, your mother. Yep, and my mother, who was a teacher, plays a, uh, plays a role uh, as well. Exactly, you'll hear her voice, and uh, uh, and you'll. But, you know, it may not be entirely clear. The you really won't see the my peers, and you won't see me. But the the uh, the people in the film uh, who were first graders in 1970, uh, you'll see. I think maybe one of them. Uh, uh, you'll see. You'll see your band. Exactly. You'll see and the, the group. Yeah, the and you'll. But you'll hear the voices of uh, of a girl who was also was a junior in high school uh, in 1968 when the sort of the the pinnacle moment of, uh, of these events, some of the things that happened. Uh, and you'll hear from some of the teachers, black and white, uh, uh, and hopefully you'll get enough of a, a taste of the story. Uh, and I guess the last thing I'll say about that too is that uh, while this is all about this one little town in Mississippi, it's about America. Uh, and it's about what I call the, 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 the greatest uh, paradox of American life perhaps today for me. And that is that in the last 50 years, uh, this is not a particularly diverse crowd tonight because we're in Vermont. I mean that's okay. Um, uh, but the uh, but uh, but over the last 50 years, we have defeated or made more progress to defeat uh, individual racism, person to person uh, racism, it, to a degree that uh, we should we we sometimes forget how much we've accomplished in terms of eliminating that kind of individual racism. My children have grown up in a very diverse world in downtown Atlanta, uh, have, have never encountered uh, anything like what would have been the most, uh, the sort of least problematic racism that I was around as a child. My kids have never encountered anything remotely like it in the world that they've grown up in. That's an enormous accomplishment for our society. But the paradox, is that while we've accomplished that and we can have diverse gatherings of people that would have been impossible not that long ago, uh, we still are a nation that collectively is always on the verge, seemingly, of some sort of explosion uh, around race in some fashion. If we got word tonight uh, that, you know, that Trenton, New Jersey was on fire um, uh, and that you know, something, there'd been a police shooting uh, in, in a certain part of town and, uh, and explosive events had followed, we would, we would regret it, but we wouldn't be surprised. We, we, could, we can hear about that at any moment, and it's like, oh gosh, it's happening again. And that's the paradox, 
you know, how did this happen? How is it that we've made so much progress on a sort of individual level, and yet we are still, uh, we have the sense that we're sitting on a tinderbox at all times, collectively. And I think that translates into some of the, you know, some of the terrible language and rhetoric and things that, that we hear said today, that we are surprised to hear said. I think it's all related to that. So in a way, this is a film that is trying to wrestle ultimately with that macro question. How did this happen? How did we do such a good job on, on a part of this? And yet we've still so blown it uh, on, on another part. Uh, and that's, that's the macro question, and this is a micro examination of one place to try to get at that. And I will say that the, my personal view is that it, a key part of the story is the, that there was an opportunity for America in the, in the 1970s, the early 70s, to use public schools at a time when 95%, 98% of, of all American children went to public schools at that time. Uh, and there was an opportunity to have, through public schools, to have uh, much more effectively uh, constructed a, a multiracial society. Um, uh, and, but we failed at that, you know, as a society. And that, I, I, I get to say that so, since I was just a kid at the time. And so uh, anybody who was old enough to remember it, well, you've screwed up. No, that, no that's not my point. <laughs> but uh, we as a society failed at that. And it's not a surprise, really. It, it, was, it was a hard thing to do, obviously. And I think the film ultimately will capture that, too. It's not just as simple as that good people were trying to do the right thing and bad people got in their way. You know, nothing ever boils down to anything as simple as that, uh, but, but the failures that did occur, including failures by people who were trying to do the right thing, and failures by black people and white people, uh, that the end result of that is that we failed to create a society that can weather some of the, some of the, uh, the tensions that percolate inside it. Well, we're going to we're going to see some of those uh, mixtures of is not villains and good guys exactly. uh, in this uh, like any human story you're going to see them in these these figures exactly okay let's take a peek well you came hurry God you just have to wait you have to trust him and give him time. Well, no matter how long it takes Well, I know he's the God you can't hurry He'll be there, just don't worry Well, he may not come when you want him, but he's right on time mm -hmm. All your takes. That's your voice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> I can't think of all of them songs. Yeah. Can you sing? He said sing? he may not come when you want him, birdie. Right on time. You can't hurry gone. You just have to wait. You have to trust him and give him time. Oh, no matter how long it takes. I said, I can't stay in this cotton field all of my life. I got to find something else to do. So I made up my mind, I said, I want to go to school. I want to go to college. You can't hurry down. Our school population need to reflect what our town population you is. I thought all white people didn't like black people because my own father wouldn't acknowledge me. I think the absence of like anything good, it just helped my drive to be better. The abundance of negativities in life is supporting my positive. He'll be there. Don't you worry. I think the whole community should be involved. And my thing is, you know, color shouldn't have anything to do with it. We have to come together and work together. Yes, I grew up uh, 
in Leland and uh, with my family. My dad, he was principal at this school. My yeah. mother was a teacher here. That's what she always did. She taught. Well, for a long time, she became the guidance counselor in later years. And along with that, she taught music oh, lessons. Yeah. We lived on the school campus for a few years. Our house was across the street. So I actually played on the schoolyard all the time, rode my bicycle. I remember riding my bicycle all around this, this outside here. But um, we lived here until I finished high school. We lived over on this track in a completely segregated neighborhood, completely segregated. And we knew about all of the things that were going on so far as blacks and white. But uh, our regular routine was just like an average family. There was still anger in the minds of uh, black Americans because of what had happened in the past, past atrocities. I was born in 45, yes. I came of age in the 60s, a child of the 60s. I thought it was a very happy world. I, when I was a, a younger child, I, I, I was not aware, I guess, of anything about civil rights. There's anger. There's anger about what happened. the lynchings, the cross burnings, there's anger. Mississippi's always been in my heart. I loved this place. Um, I love the beauty of the Delta, um, the history. This, this place gave me an awful lot to carry with me. There have been times, you know, like going to the cotton fields where the person that owned the plantation was not always kind didn't always speak favorably. And, and so those were the times that I remembered that there were some people that didn't like me because of my color. But it was always a challenge to me. One day, we can look each other in the eye. You're no better. I'm no better. We're equal. We chose to live in Leland. We arrived in September of 1967. The schools were already partially integrated under a freedom of choice plan. In the beginning, there were no white children in the previously all-black school, but there were black children in the previously all-white school. You could just freely go over and enroll in that school, even though you knew uh, that y you would have some animosity toward you if you enroll there. That's, that's what it was. You just could go where you wanted, freedom of choice. But it was only a handful of families here in Leland that was willing to put their kids into the school system over there at first. Oh, they went over to the white school. Oh, they did, okay. No, none came over this way, but a few of the uh, black parents sent their children to the white school, white school. But uh, I can't remember any whites coming over to this school until the desegregation order came down, of course. You know, it was a lot of pressure on the parents who had their kids there. I think some of them just didn't want the, you know, they thought it was, it was destroying the black schools, I think. A lot of the people in the community, not a lot of them, but a few who did go over to that school, uh, they thought that maybe they would get better the teachers were better trained. I thought by having these integrated schools that our kids would have an opportunity to have a better education. This is what I thought. All blacks that was involved was nervous about it because we didn't know what was going to happen next, but we were still trying to do what we felt like was right. They saw the need to assign a few of the uh, black teachers to the white school and a few of the white teachers to the black school. This is the transitioning period. I happen to be one of the ones who did go to uh, the white school. There were news stories all of the time about uh, the push for integration in different parts of the country, of the South, and in different ways, like the sit-ins in different places. As the school year 1969-70, began to approach, there was a lot more discussion about that full integration is getting closer. You have one shot at raising your children. You don't get do-overs. 
And I can't remember any incidents uh, that happened when they went to the, to the white school. It was something that nobody had done before. We didn't know how it was going to go, uh, but we felt strongly that we had to, had to give it a chance. There, there were several community meetings, as I recall. There were little placards with statements that said, uh, uh, keep a positive attitude about this. Don't assume that it's going to all be negative. And then as we got closer to knowing that total integration was actually going to happen soon, this group that pledged to keep our children in public school uh, decided to buy an ad uh, in the local newspaper, the Leland Progress, and put our name on the line that uh, we are committed to public education, and we plan to keep our children in public school. I remember the superintendent coming over and explaining to us what was going on, and it was going on because of this order. And of course, he was expecting everybody to uh, try to make the path smooth, you know, try to smooth the path when we desegregated. And we did so as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Well, it's here. It's going to happen. Let's make the best of it. Most of us made up our minds, and I guess on the white, the white teachers did the same thing. It's here, we're gonna either take it, or we can leave and go to private schools or whatever. So we knew we weren't going to private school to teach, so we weren't going to any place else. Oh, I remember that the faculties actually got along pretty well, the people on the faculty, uh, after complete desegregation. The whites and the blacks, some of us became friends on down through the years. School was closed for as I remember it, for a week. Because they had to get the, the, all the little desks at one school and then all of the larger desks at another school. So it was a working thing for us because we helped that. You know, the books had to be exchanged. So it's just more or less getting the rooms straight in, straight now. So we're assigning teaching duties to the teachers. Now we got this integration thing going here. So white parents were reluctant, a lot of them, about black teaching their children. And so they wanted to be sure that the black teachers were qualified, maybe were able to speak or teach or whatever it was. So they were a little reluctant. Oh, at the time of integration, I, my expectations of what white families would do would be to leave the schools. I didn't expect them to stay. I didn't expect all of them to stay. And see, a lot of that, I think, had to do with ignorance. I'm sorry. I mean, I mean, I mean it not knowing. If you don't know something, you're fearful of it. And so many of the white families had only known their maids. And some of them just, they were people, but not people, you know? I really had never had a conversation with a black person as equals until uh, my children started school in Leland and Veronica Richardson was one of my oldest son Glenn's teachers. Uh, and I wanted her to know that I was okay <laughs> with, with my child being in her class. So it surprised me when uh, things went pretty smoothly here. You know, we didn't have any kind of rock throwing, uh, bomb throwing things. When they first did the desegregation, of course, they had to come to school over here because that was the only uh, available thing, except for a Catholic school. But after a few years, you had available private schools. I know it a, a lot of people left at that time to go to Pillow. And some people in the community didn't want the mixture, so those schools were born at that time. But uh, at that time, it didn't really bother me that they had pri uh, that private schools were set up. But I always wondered after a while, oh, uh, how could all of them go to, how could all the whites go to the private school? And what was there that was so different? That's what I've been wanting to ask somebody. <laughs> uh, it's just exactly what, and I wonder if uh, we could really get to that, uh, what made that change? because we catered to everybody, we catered to the whites a good bit. After full integration, 
uh, if you just took percentages over the entire school population uh, the, in the public schools in Leland. Uh, it was approximately 80% black and 20% white. I had really close friends who made the decision to send their children to private schools. Uh, and I could understand their choice, even though I didn't agree with their choice. And I would say that the majority of them never gave me a hard time. This was not something that kept us from being friends and kept us from going to church together. I think if we had talked more among ourselves and we could have worked out the adults, we could have worked out a, a few more things where more of the whites could remain in the public schools. I would have been outside this building for the last time in May of 1970. I was finishing up my junior year of high school and um, getting ready to leave Leland. I was substitute teaching in, in the spring of 1970 uh, and there was a pretty massive student walkout from Leland High School uh, led by student leaders as far as I know. When the day happened of the boycott here, a part of me was drawn in because this felt right to be doing something. I mean, I had grown up knowing that things weren't right. <laughs> it's not like it just, just became obvious. The segregation was so totally pervasive. There were people who honestly believed, believed in their heart that black people had no souls, that they were more like animals. There was this huge crowd out here, and I just walked up and said, what's going on? And so I was like, well, I want to join you. <laughs> and the next thing I know, everybody's gone down to the auditorium. The teachers came out on the stage and talked for a little while. You know, now you're here, you want to make a statement. Um, this is what you need to do. You need to organize your grievances. I remember the word being used. You need a list of grievances to bring to the, um, the principal. There were a few white students who also walked out and marched with them. Uh, and they marched from Leland High School, the Dean campus, through town to the uh, black high school, the Lincoln High School. Uh, now I was on the on the Lincoln campus that day, and it, it was a scary thing. Uh, nobody knew what might happen. No, I didn't have any knowledge of what it was really about. Uh, all I knew to do was to go to school and have fun and try to get along. And I can remember my mother giving my sisters and brothers some strong advice and harsh words that she said she didn't care who walked out. You all bust their school. Everybody was very calm. You know, there was no yelling or, or um, you know, um, people were sitting quietly in their seats having a discussion. I think we should, people should be proud of us <laughs> the, way it, the way it went off. The walkout from the high school really unnerved the community. Uh, because it was almost like it gave people a reason to say, see, that's why I don't want to send my kids to public school. Today it was a peaceful march, but who knows what the next one might be like. For the white community, it seemed almost like a slap in the face, where, okay, you have won on the integration, and now you're not happy, you walk out. After the boycott here, that day when I got home. Um, my mother met me at the front door and said, what's going on? Because she had been receiving phone calls saying things like, your daughter's going to die and hanging up. I do think that after that, the night riding and the uh, phone calls accelerated. You could 
hear somebody run across the lawn yelling. And I think the word might be nigger or nigger lover, multiple incidences of that kind of thing. And then of course the, um, the words nigger in probably about eight foot letters across our lawn um, with weed killers so that the grass would turn brown. If you were called a nigger lover back then, that was the worst thing that could happen to you. Your whole livelihood, your social standing, everything, if you were if you were easy on the blacks, that was bad. I don't recall being afraid, but I guess um, my, my parents, the, I guess maybe they didn't know what to do about all of the threats and of course when the when the bank the insurance was canceled and the bank called the loan then it became very serious i lost hundreds of subscribers it cost me all kind of subscribers and of course that's what what you base your advertising on you get advertising for subscribers but it was both ostracism and economic one of my teachers here at the school cornered me one day and after the um, boycott when I was identified as having participated cornered me in the hallway and and asked me if I would ever marry a black man would you marry one and I said if I loved him <laughs> and uh, and he said black fat lips and all, you would do that? And <laughs> I, I was honestly didn't know how to respond. My father called his boss and said, I need you to transfer me out of here now. And so they did, and I guess they offered him Lubbock, Texas, and he took it. You said beforehand that this was a, a national experiment that's happening across the entire country. There are thousands of communities that were going through something similar, um, each slightly different. Um, uh, did you feel like this was ground zero? Was, is this talk is in, entitled ground zero for race uh, at that time? Or did you look back at it? I mean, you didn't when you were... I think that if you look back at it, it that this is ground zero, uh, the, the collective story, the macro story is sort of ground zero for the conversation about race and our experiences related to race as they continue today. That the, the, the sort of modern, the modern version of our struggle as a nation around race begins at that moment. In, in, and what it really begins with uh, is very specifically in October of 1969, we've all gotten a little confused about this, this uh, chronology but we're the, in October 69, the Supreme Court issues a ruling called Alexander v. Holmes, uh, usually referred to just as the Holmes decision. Uh, but, uh, but that's the decision that, that actually ends segregation in America and ends segregated schools, legally segregated schools. The, uh, the Brown decision is obviously the most historic and the, the bedrock decision, but basically after Brown, uh, nothing really all that significant happens for 15 years. Uh, and, uh, and so you'll hear it talked about that, oh, the schools were integrated in Little Rock in 1957 and that led to the Little Rock crisis or, uh, you know, any number of places we'll talk about that the schools were desegregated in 1962 or 1964 or whatever. But what's being described in all of those cases is what Veronica Richardson, one of the African-American teachers you saw in the film, it's what she's talking about when, when yes, you could go wherever you wanted to, and a few black families sent their children to the white schools, but no white kids came to the black schools. And so for most of the 20 years after, after the Brown decision, you still have, in almost everywhere that there had been separate schools before, there are still separate schools 15 years later. It's just that there are a few black kids who go to the white school. And, but it's not until 1969 that the Supreme Court finally says, in a case that was brought from about 30 districts in Mississippi, including this one, including my town, uh, the, all these cases have been consolidated before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court says, enough. Uh, it, it, all, of the, all of this delay has to stop. And, that's in the, and the court actually says, close your schools 
at Christmas of 1969 and reopen, when you reopen in, in 1970, uh, there can be only one system in every place. And so that's the moment, and that's what they were talking about, this one week or two week period, depending on how people remember it, where it's topsy-turvy and, and these two systems are combined. Um, and that's also when the great majority of white families abandoned public schools in every place in America where there are any black people, uh, any significant numbers of black people. And this is the time in, in Boston where there was forced busing and a lot of violence, a lot of uh, turmoil. Um, so it wasn't a southern thing, it was a national. Uh, exactly. And, the, yeah. and it's easy to, at one point when we were first talking about making this film, uh, my main collaborator and I uh, initially talked about whether we should de-Mississippi it. Uh, and when we first started shooting, we actually said, you know, maybe we should do this in a way where uh, you can tell it's a farm town somewhere but you never say the name of the town, or you never say Mississippi, and you maybe the accents will signal something. But you know, maybe can we do this in a way where audiences will actually wonder, you know, okay, is this Southern Illinois or is this Mississippi or you know what? Uh, because of this very thing was that we don't want it to be received as a story about what happened in a little town in Mississippi. Uh, we, we really hope that it is something that triggers people to think about this much bigger, broader story that involved millions of children and 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 was the you know i mean it's not just in my town that the people who are in their 50s are now you know who were kids at this time are now stepping into those community leadership roles that's how it is you know that's what happens in your 50s you know that's when you run for mayor or whatever uh and the, and so the the people who are moving into that generational leadership uh, all across america are ones who are very much informed by those events uh, in the late 60s and early 70s, uh, and that's a time where people were trying to do the right thing, but it failed. It failed. It failed in this profound way that, uh, I mean, it, there was good from it, and it was necessarily the right thing to do, you know, but ultimately it failed at the primary objective. What, what advice do you have, if any, for either for the present day or what, what might have uh, caused things to work out better? Well, there, uh, I could do a lot, and of course, it's also very easy for somebody who was six years old in 1970 to, to talk about how the adults failed in 1970. <laughs> That's an easy, easy thing for me to do. Uh, but one of the things that I have learned from this is uh, that I believe to be the case, and I still see, see the case, and I have been involved as an adult in a lot of education-related work in Atlanta where, you know, where I've raised my kids. And, uh, and one thing is that uh, you can't underestimate how hard things are. You can't pretend that just because something's right, that it's going to be easy. And we've certainly seen that on a lot of fronts in the last few years. Uh, that, uh, and so, sure, of course it was, you know, it was terribly wrong uh, for there to be segregated schools. It was terribly wrong, the, you know, the discrimination that had occurred. And obviously the right thing was for all that to come to an end. Uh, but just because it's right doesn't mean it's going to happen very easily. And, and also, it doesn't mean that even the people who resist what's obviously right may not necessarily be evil. Now, some of them are going to be evil. You know, there, there is some evil behavior. But they're also, like my mother talked about in the clip you saw, that, uh, you know, that most of the friends of my parents uh, who didn't send their kids to the public school, who pulled out, were still fundamentally good people. You know, those are the people I went to church with, uh, you know, that I grew, and I grew up with their children. You know? Uh, and they were not demonic people. Uh, and so the, you know, how do you tackle really hard things uh, in a way that you have to acknowledge that even the people who are wrong can't be simply discarded? You know? Now the flip side of all that, that also involved in all that, is that everything was done on white people's terms. You know? the, so when the, you, the and, and it cuts a lot of different ways. Uh, African Americans in this town, as was the case in many places, and it's almost never discussed. But the the black lady in the film who uh, is saying at one point, uh, a lot of people were just concerned about they didn't know what was going to happen with their children if they sent them to that school. Well, well, you think that's those would be the words of a white person afraid to send their children to a black school or an integrated school. But that's she's talking about black families afraid to send black children to the white school, you know, because this this we don't know what's going to happen. And then there's a line from her where she says a lot of people thought that was just an effort to destroy the black schools, quote unquote, because black schools, these segregated black schools, who you know that were uh, an instrument of apartheid. You know that's really what we're talking about here. This was American apartheid 
And there's really, we, we, we have shied away from that sort of terminology, but that's exactly what it was. It was an apartheid system. Uh, and, and one of the elements of an apartheid system was this, this all black school system that is inherently an abuse of African Americans, but it also was a place, it was a cherished place. Because aside from the black church, it's the sanctuary in which African Americans have the most control over their lives and where African Americans have leadership positions and, and are not operating constantly under the dictates of white people. And so the black schools that are destroyed through integration are actually refuges, important refuges for African Americans. And so from the perspective of whites at the time, that's invisible. You know, the, just like my mother says, uh, that you know, from, a, from the perspective of most whites, even what very well-intentioned whites, they said, well, of course, they, of course you know, they're not going to mind that their schools are going away because that's the whole point of these lawsuits is that they want their children to go to our schools. So why would they be bothered that their schools then go away? Uh, so well, there was a great loss there. It was huge. People, both uh, blacks and whites hadn't appreciated that. Right? Yeah, and there was, there was almost no dialogue about those sorts of things. There was no real comprehension uh, of, of some of those factors. Uh, and uh, it's not at all uncommon today, in fact. I've encountered uh, enormous numbers of, of uh, people, of African Americans, 20 years older than me, uh, but where you'll have someone who graduated from high school somewhere in the South in the late 1960s or the early 1960s, and then they left the South and they went to Michigan or somewhere in the North or Northeast, and they worked in an auto factory or something, like that, but had a, had a good solid life uh, wherever they moved to, and then they've retired. Uh, and they go back to their home county uh, you know, uh, because African Americans, culturally, I would say, uh, in broad statements about culture, uh, ethnically identified, are, are always a, a bad idea. But I think there's some truth to that. Uh, that among those Southern African Americans who moved north uh, over many generations, there is typically much more of a, a rootedness uh, and kind of connectivity back to where their family originally came from in the South than is often the case with white Southerners. And, uh, and so I've encountered lots of these folks, uh, usually men, interestingly, I'm not, I'm not sure what, why, if there's a gender distinction or why, but uh, an African-American guy in his 70s who moves back to his hometown, or close to his hometown, and one of the first things that he does is he says, what happened to my high school? You know, and hey, we were, you know, we were the state championship champions in basketball in 1962, and I was on the team, you know, or, uh, and you know, Where's our trophy? You know, the, you know the, and so if you think about it in your own life, you know, this thing that was the sort of pinnacle achievement of this young man's life, and now he's gone away for the other half of his life, and he comes back, and it's as if it never happened. Uh, and the, and so the the trauma of these events, which were correct, you know, these these were events that had to happen. Yeah, you know, uh, and uh, you know the. Uh, but they were nonetheless extraordinarily complicated and traumatic and had all sorts of ramifications that nobody was really thinking about. And really, we could hardly expect anybody to be thinking about these things. Nonetheless, that's a part of why, uh, why there was ultimately so much difficulty in achieving uh, what, what the goal really was. So, what, Doug, what does this uh, film have to say? Why is this important uh, for people in Vermont, which is just barely the second uh, uh, whitest state in the Union. Uh, Maine has is 0.1% uh, uh, less diverse than we are. Why, what does this film um, say to Vermonters? I think it says a lot of things. Um, one is that, uh, that this is not just a Southern issue. You know, uh, because the, even though it's still the case that uh, uh, you're much more likely to find yourself in a place in the South that has a very diverse population. And so the town that I grew up in, that, that, my, that my family grew up, lived in in those years, uh, was the town was majority black, the county was very majority black, and was surrounded by counties that were even more majority black. Um, and so you know, that's not an experience you're gonna have in Vermont or Maine or, a lot of, or Iowa um, in most places. But the, and so it's easy to fall into this idea that, well, those are things, these distant things that don't really relate to the world that, that I live in wherever I am. It doesn't look that way. But the reality is, do, you know, do you care that Ferguson happened? You know, that's, the, that's really the question. You know, do you want to live in a country that, do any of us want to live in a country where, you know, it's really great that my kids know black kids at school and, you know, and they're growing up 
not with the crazy prejudices that, uh, you know, the, of the past, and okay, that's really great, but the place they live could explode any day, you know, over, over things that we can't understand, we can't figure out why, you know, do we care about that? You know, do we care about these things keep happening? Do we care about wherever you fall on the Black Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, whose fault is it, cops, you know, uh, um, uh, all, all you know, behavior of citizens, you know, wherever you are on any of that stuff, uh, do you want it to keep happening? <laughs> you know, no, you know, wherever you live and whether you think it's ever going to happen in your town, is that what is that what ought to be happening in America? No, it's not. Uh, and the and so for to make those things stop happening, uh, we've got to we've got to go back a little bit and figure out. You know, why this, uh, this incredibly optimistic and hopeful thing didn't turn out, uh, and, the, and how do we restart it somehow? And if those of my classmates back in Leland, Mississippi, are now in their own complicated ways trying to grapple with that question, because they could also, you know, the, the, the whites are all gone from the public schools. Essentially what you now have is that the public schools are what the old black schools were. You know, they, you know, all black schools run by black people for the most part, uh, and uh, except for the occasional Teach for America good-hearted liberal, you know, who comes down for you know a couple of years, you know, those are the only white people that most of those black kids ever encounter, you know, uh, uh, anymore. And uh, and so in a way, the segregated black schools of the past are back you know, in this place because all the whites have left, and the black leaders of that community could say, screw them, you know, we don't care if they come back. And that's, and in fact, that, that's not been an uncommon attitude at times. Uh, but if those black folks are actually having a conversation about, okay, this isn't really what we wanted, is it? You know, and this isn't really what our community should be, is it? You know, what do we do? You know, have, the same question you're asking. Because you could sort of say, I haven't thought of it this way before, but in the same way that it's a very reasonable question to ask in Vermont, what does, you know, what does it really matter, you know, because we don't really have the obvious version of this issue in front of us. Well, you could, the same question could be asked of, a, of an overwhelmingly black town in Mississippi, you know, of, you know, well, why, you know, why care? Why do anything to, to attract, uh, to, to try to end up with a, a multiracial school system again? You know, well, why? Because it's America, you know? Who uh, else? Who, who, who do we mean when we say, uh, this is our problem, or? that it's we or us. Yeah. Well, speaking of us, uh, can we turn the lights on and, and invite you to um, join in your questions or comments for Doug? Yes, sir, I have them. Yeah, um, I don't understand. Are the, in down south, so the public schools are black, and the white are still are paying taxes for those schools and then sending their children. Exactly. How can one afford to do that? It's a good question. Uh, the uh, and the, did everybody did you ever hear that question? The, uh, the question was uh, essentially just trying to understand the uh, uh, you know how is it that the so the public schools are now all black and are whites still paying taxes that support the public schools, but then separately sending their children to private schools that are all white or virtually all white? And the answer is yes. Uh, and so what happened uh, pretty much everywhere in the South that there was a significant black population uh, when that order came down in 1969. And this had, this had begun in a few of places earlier, but overwhelmingly it's in the fall of 1969 when it's clear that the Supreme Court is going to, is going to force uh, this to happen, the, the elimination of the dual systems. And it also becomes clear that the Nixon administration is not going to be able to undo that. There was a lot of hope across the South that the Nixon administration was going to somehow keep that from really happening. And it becomes clear that they're not. They're not going to be able to do that. And so instantly, overnight, uh, the, the public school systems of the South are replicated you know, overnight. Uh, and in every town of any size whatsoever, including this one, there is literally, at the same time that those desks are being shuffled around at the public schools to merge the black and white school systems together, there are meetings going on among whites to say, well, we've got to start a private school because there were no private schools. And I, again, this is sort of a foreign. The, you guys have this fascinating, you know, New England tradition here of uh, of this hybrid between private and public schools as 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 the place where we are now. 
But there was no version of that in the South, overwhelmingly, nothing remotely like that. There, except for a few Catholic schools, like one that was briefly referenced in there, there were no private schools anywhere in the South uh, in, the, in any meaningful number. Um, and so you have just instantly overnight, uh, there is a, a new private school system created in every town of any consequence. Um, and they were, in the beginning in particular, they were very bad. You know, they were, you know, really, uh, uh, um, they, and, you, and so they were opened up in church education buildings and, you know, this, but then over time, they, uh, the assumption was that they would sort of peter out and whites would start going back and because that whole thing was beyond the imagination of anybody. There's a lot about this story that just uh, was sort of a failure of imagination. Even when the Supreme Court said, okay, enough, you know, put the, you know, push everything together, nobody on the Supreme Court, and it was argued to them even, that well, if you do that, all the whites will leave. Uh, and they'll go and just set up their own schools. Well, that, that seemed impossible. You know, how, how could a third of the country just do that overnight? And you know, uh, but they did, and, and they cared enough to pay for it. And it's, uh, this ironic uh, rhetorical question that one of the African American women says in the film about, I'd like to ask them, what is it that you do over there that you like it so much? Over there? Yeah, what are you getting over there? That you're not getting over and the there? answer is, uh, it's segregated. But another little dimension of that uh, that isn't thought about much is that that's also part of you know, a place like Mississippi can't afford that. A place like Mississippi has trouble affording one school system in every place. And so you come along and say, okay, we're going to have two you know, school systems in every place. And the second one is, you know, is not paid for through the collection of taxes, but nonetheless, those are resources and wealth that there's only so many dollars in any place at any given time. Uh, and if you, if you begin to, one of the reasons you become a place that's opposed to any greater taxation whatsoever is because you've got this burden of paying for this private school system over here too. You know? And so the inefficiency, of, it's, it's no surprise that the weakest and lowest performing public school systems in America are in the places where this incredible diversion of resources and people has occurred. Um, I see a question here, but I want to there's a student. Some student questions here, too. Okay, yeah. Okay, so um, I was going to ask, if your mother had made the choice to send you to a private school, do you think you would still be as driven to tell this story to us and present it? Or would you uh, have gone down another path with another story? Yeah. Can you hear that? Yeah, the question was, if, you hear if, if my parents had, had made the opposite decision and sent me to one of those private schools, uh, would I... Would I be here tonight? Uh, you know, or you know, to would tell I, this story, to tell this story, or you know, or the other sorts of things that I've written about? And the answer is, uh, who knows, uh, really? You know, um, I suspect I would be a very different person uh, in, in many respects. But the, uh, but I, you know, but like I've got two older brothers, and uh, they haven't had their entire lives consumed with asking these questions. You know, and they, and they went to the public schools. So there's some reason why the, you know these are things that that hung with me from an early point, and this did. I, I had a consciousness of of uh, these things from a very early stage in life, uh, and uh, and so you know, so it's not just that you know. Uh, but who knows? Uh, well, uh, this may be uh, an interesting uh, time to ask you about it because you spent a lot of your journalistic career and the, the two biggest projects of your professional life have had to do with race in America. And that actually started when you were a kid, right? In seventh grade or something. Yeah, the, the, it's, it's true. The, the um, uh, uh, and I still don't know. You know, I, I I do recall very clearly that even as a little boy, um, I had a consciousness of, and I was perplexed by the obvious reality that that all the black people in my world, including the kids I went to school with, with just a tiny number of exceptions. Um, that the basically all the black people in my world clearly had lives with far more obstacles in front of them than I did, or any of my white peers. You know that, um, and our family wasn't. We weren't rich planters or anything like. My dad worked for the government. My mom was a school teacher, uh, and uh, you know we were a pretty normal sort of family. We'd come from some sort of special, vaunted status. Uh, but the but I had an awareness of that. There, why is it that? that all the black people live in these conditions and even the modest uh, uh, lives of white people are, are by comparison dramatically different. So I, I had a consciousness of that uh, for some reason at a really early age. 
And then when I was in the seventh grade, what you're fishing for, um, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I, there was an essay contest that year uh, in, I think this would have been 19, 77 or 76, something like that. And so it's the bicentennial time, uh, you know, and, the, and that was also the sesquicentennial of the county. Uh, and who knows what sesquicentennial means? I think that's 125 or something. Or is that right? Yeah, okay. Uh, and the, um, and the sesquicentennial of the county. It was the 125th anniversary of the county. And so the County Historical Society which is a synonym, synonym for organization of little old white ladies. Um, uh, but, the, 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 uh, but so the County Historical Society had an essay contest in conjunction with the sesquicentennial celebration and that any student at any school in the county, public or private, could write an essay uh, about any aspect of the history of the county. So very wide open. Uh, and, and so I decided to write an essay for the contest and uh, chose as my topic, and I was just talking to John about this earlier, uh, that why I selected or how I even knew about this place called Strike City. So that black and white footage you saw of, uh, of where these strikers had been forced off the, off the farm where they lived, uh, they end up in this tent encampment, and that's the, the footage at the very beginning, and that place came to be known as Strike City. And it's still there, and there's the lady who was singing. Is there's one striker, uh, a lot still alive, who's still living in Strike City today. Um, and uh, John talked to her a couple of days ago, I think. And the but somehow I had an awareness of that place, which is surprising because uh, I believe it's true that no adult white person, whatever their issue politics would have been at the time, no adult white person would have ever mentioned the existence of that place to a white child. It would have never been referenced. And, uh, and, the, and so how I knew about it, I don't even know anymore. Uh, but uh, for some reason, I was curious about it, and I decided to write an essay about Strike City uh, for the contest. And uh, I was joking earlier, I then did what all white people do on projects like this. I went and talked to the other white people who had been involved uh, uh, in, in this. And so I actually went and talked to the plantation owner, you know, the bad guy um, who evicted these folks. But it didn't occur to me to talk to any of the black people who were involved. It really didn't even occur to me that the place might still exist. Because I had, in a kind of 12-year-old mind, um, even though the events were you know, just only about 12 years old, in my mind, it was sort of an ancient event that I heard about, you know, like, like the sinking of a Greek ship, you know, a thousand, you know, and you know, no one, it, it couldn't be that it still existed or that anybody associated with it was still alive, even though I had talked to the, you know, one of the principals involved in it. So, you know, just kid thinking. Uh, and, uh, but so I talked to Mr. Andrews, I read newspaper articles, and I write this essay, this very sweet seventh grader essay about how these farm workers uh, bravely went on strike in 1965 and they were forced out of their homes and they were attacked by the Ku Klux Klan and shot at and, and, that, uh, and not the men couldn't get jobs again, all was true, uh, all these terrible things happened. Uh, and that then Martin Luther King came along and everything was fixed in America. That, that, was, that was sort of my essay. Um, and, uh, it started in the seventh grade. Started in the seventh grade. And uh, the last thing I'll say about that is that the, um, I won second place in the essay contest. Um, um, uh, and I was very pleased about that. And, uh, and my mother took me to the county fair the day of the award ceremony because I'd gotten a letter in the mail from a Mrs. Baker. Uh, and that it told me I had won. And the day of the award ceremony, I should go there where to go, and she would be there wearing a blue dress, and I should go there and find her, and then there would be the award ceremony. And so my mom dropped me off at the county fair. I went to the appointed place. There was a white lady there in a blue dress. It was obviously Mrs. Baker. But I was uh, too timid to introduce myself. I was afraid that it might not be her, and I would be embarrassed. And so, so I stood there for a long time waiting for her to, uh, to, to recognize me. And she looked at me a couple of times and blankly and you know, no recognition or anything. And then uh, after a little while, another little white boy comes along who I knew from church circles, uh, but who went to one of the private schools, the all white schools. And he walked up and they began talking and he was also a winner in the, in the contest. And so now I knew that this really was Mrs. Baker. And so I walked up and said, hi, my name's Doug Blackman. And, uh, and I don't know if I instantly realized it or if it came to me later, but uh, 
I, I did realize that from the look on her face and then the, the, that the topic of my essay, that I was a student at what to her would have been an all black school. That's what she would have perceived to be an all black school. And the curiosity of my last name, the coincidence of my last name, uh, I was supposed to be a little black boy um, uh, uh, getting the prize that day. And uh, so I like to joke that I was an early beneficiary of affirmative action, um, uh, and, and unfairly. So. You had a question, yeah, Frank. Um, you recognize that Vermont is practically all white. Right. What is it that you would have us do? as a state to, because we're very informed, you know, we read the newspapers, we watch television, uh, we visit other states. What is it that you feel that people such as we are, what can we do? Well, I think there are two approaches to that. Uh, the most important approach is to ask yourself that, you know, uh, because I, uh, and, and that I can't really answer. You know, the, the, and my guess is that even with the, the extremely white nature of Vermont, uh, my guess is that, uh, and I think you would probably agree with this, I bet, you know, it doesn't mean that, uh, that there are no problems uh, in this category. Uh, and, the, uh, and so I think that if nothing else, the, the first thing I say to almost anybody about this is, is you know, is your sense of self-awareness really as valid as yeah, we're a liberal state? Sure, uh, but and I, you know, and, and, uh, and there are a lot of good liberals who uh, who thought they were 100 percent on the right side of these events, mm -hmm. and in hindsight, you look back and say maybe they weren't. You know, maybe maybe the maybe the, some of the approaches taken weren't actually not what you know were not ideal. And so I think that's the first thing I would say is is don't make the mistake, and I don't think you are making this mistake, but I would say don't ever make the mistake of thinking, well, this really isn't our issue, and so we don't really have a problem. You know? And so I would guard against that. But also, I think that we live in a time when there are people ruthlessly and actively and relentlessly telling us that none of these issues exist anywhere. You know? uh, that you know, it doesn't matter that, uh, that, that uh, you know, that there are places where there are lots of black people, just like the people who are telling us that, well, you know, what happened in Ferguson was the fault of black people, you know, uh, and, uh, uh, and, you know, we have a long tradition in our country of blaming any bad thing that occurs in the lives of, of uh, non-majority people, that it's always the fault of those people somehow, all the way down to, you know, higher rates of heart disease. Well, it's their fault, you know. Uh, and so I, I think that in a national conversation, we. We need to have an active national conversation that goes back into these issues. Uh, and that's something that every American can be a part of. Yes, sir. Milton tells the story about uh, school segregation and the difficulties of desegregation and integration. <clears throat> and you say that as a society we failed at the macro level in, in that regard. Um, but it seems to me that a even deeper issue is residential segregation. Uh, and it's a much more difficult thing even to come to grips with than desegregating or integrating schools. I wonder if you could comment. Sure. Well, and, uh, and quickly, what the question is about is, is uh, very eloquently stated, but the, the part of it, I think, is that uh, isn't residential segregation, the persistence of that, uh, and which is even more difficult to, to combat. Uh, is it that as big or bigger, or you know, and so can we can we even address these things if we uh, with the residential segregation that we've got? And that's a very legitimate question. The first thing I would say though to it is that under the laws as they exist in America, we can't really do anything about residential segregation, but we can do something about what our public schools look like, uh, and we can. It's and that's why I go back to the the tragedy of this of this whole story for the nation is that it's through public schools, where in 1969, 98, 99% of all children in America went to public schools. And public schools were the, we didn't, we didn't have, the government did not have the power to say, okay, we're gonna integrate every neighborhood in America, we're gonna make a bunch of black people move to Vermont, a bunch of people in Vermont, white people in Vermont have to move to Alabama, you know. Government can't do that. We probably don't want the government to be able to do that. I certainly would be rather cautious about that. 
But what the government can do is, and what the people can do, uh, is be willing to pay the taxes that are necessary for the resources to be made available and the leadership to be identified and the, the policies and approaches to be figured out uh, and in a way that we can have public schools everywhere in the country uh, that do a much better job of advancing, not a political agenda, but advancing what it is that supposedly we all believe. Uh, that this is a society in which it doesn't matter what your race is uh, and that opportunity is afforded to everybody. And that just because you're born poor or born brown or born whatever, uh, that, that that means that you automatically are gonna be, uh, you, you, that you really do have a significantly lesser probability of success in life. Uh, and, if, and that's a commitment that we ought to make nationally. Uh, and, you know, there are, no, uh, there are no rocket ships taking off from Vermont, as far as I know. Uh, but, and so, you know, that's a, but rocket ships are not a Florida thing. You know, they are an American thing. Uh, and, uh, and in the same way that, you know, if it's a good, if there's a role for people in, in Maine to play in terms of supporting NASA and the, that our, we collectively as a nation think those are good things to do and let's, let's, let's learn the things that we learned from trying to go to Mars, uh, if that's a national thing, a national endeavor, then this should be a national endeavor. Uh, and uh, you, you know, you remind me of you know, uh, during the Cold War, there was a New Yorker talking to a mother, and he said, "Boy, if nuclear war breaks out between Soviet Union and the United States, I'm moving to Vermont." And their mother says, "You know, I think if uh, nuclear war breaks out between." the Soviet Union and the United States from I'll be dragged into it sooner or later. <laughs> Which is a way to say we are in this together. We're all in the same boat. Uh, slice it however you want. Um, this is our problem, it's not somebody else's problem. And it's up to us to try to figure it out. All right. the, the white hair and the mic, have, he really is Phil Donahue. That's right. Just I was wondering if you uh, ever felt any resentment disillusionment by not having been sent to one of these private schools and if how how did that affect your social life and with your friends and associates yeah it's a really interesting question I, I mean, you heard it the, um, the and in ways that uh, maybe are a little unpredictable but what it did create uh, the this this sort of world in which you've got that all the black kids go to public schools and most of the white kids go to this private school and then there's this one small group of white kids who go to the public school with black kids you know so that's so, but all right so i'm one of the uh so i'm one of the good white kids by you know by the way that i saw it though i didn't really understand any of this at the time uh, like i didn't know that our class was the first class to go all 12 grades black and white together i didn't know that until most of 10 years later uh, I was reading a book about a different town in Mississippi that made reference to that having happened in that particular class. And I called my mom up and I said, you know, was my class, was that the case with my class too? You know, and she said, well, yeah, it was, you know. But I, so, so I didn't have, I, I had no awareness at the time that, uh, of just how new all this was. So it was just how you think as a kid. You think that how everything's are now is sort of how things have always been. Uh, and, uh, and I was only faintly aware that that it was, had been such, that just a very short time earlier that all white people had gone to all white schools. I only vaguely was aware of that uh, as a kid. But, the, but what I was very aware of was that I went to the schools with black kids and somehow in the kind of moral rationalizations that I was absorbing, um, that meant that I was a good white. You know, and, the, and the white kids who went to the private schools, that there was, they were not bad but there was something dirty about what they were doing. I didn't know what it was, you know, exactly, but I knew that there was something, there was something that tainted them for going to those private schools. And, uh, and then I began to figure out that they had attitudes toward black people that were likely to be different from mine and different from what my parents were teaching. And so I slowly figured out, oh, it has something to do with that, you know, and, and there would be comments and things. But it created this strange dynamic where, because the, while the schools had been integrated, nothing else had been. 
You know, so I went to school with, with these, uh, with black kids, overwhelmingly with black kids. But my, ba my little league baseball team was still all white. You know, there were still separate baseball leagues um, uh, for black kids and white kids. Uh, the church that I went to was all white, except for the janitor and the lady who worked in the daycare. Uh, and, uh, you know, everything was still archly segregated except the school experience. And so most of my white friends were these tainted, you know, tainted kids who were going to the private schools. And they knew that they were perceived as tainted somehow. And, and, they, and they didn't like that. You know, they, they were pissed off about that. And so you had this weird dynamic of that those kids were, the, the private school kids were mad, it seemed to me, were always a little mad at the public school white kids. And so we were mad back at them. But then you'd go to school, and, you'd go, and, and there was all this animosity at school, too, where uh, that is, is, that's where, like, the lady, Deborah Coleman, who was talking about, there was all this anger. Because I, and that was an, an answer to me asking her, what was all the anger about then? You know, it's because on the African-American side of the equation, one would have thought, you, you know, from a white person's perspective, like my mom was reflecting, you could say, well, you know, black folks have just had this huge victory. You know, they've won this court case and you know, the integration of schools has happened. And so what is all this anger about from that side? And of course, what, and that's why her answer, I think, is so poignant is this, you know, angry about everything that has come before. And so those kids are mad too, you know, and the, so you have this crazy dynamic of the black kids are mad at all the white kids. The white kids are, are mad at each other for these various reasons. And anybody who's mad at you, you're going to be mad back at them, even though if other times you're friends with them. And so it was, a, it was this crazy, tense environment in which there's really no... We, we Oh, we have time for two more questions, and I, and I can we find students who can student questions? Anybody? Anybody under eighteen? <laughs> <laughs> so you said earlier that you think in nineteen seventy the people who worked on desegregating the schools kind of failed, but what do you think would have been a better approach to? Which is a great question and, and is instructive to the present somehow. It's not a formula for the present, but it's instructive to the present. The, the irony is that, uh, and I don't want to get into too much into the weeds of this history, but there is a huge irony that, to, that relates to that question. And that is that the, when the Brown decision occurs in 1954, and you have total, total rejection everywhere in the South, you know, everywhere that there is any kind of black population, any place that has separate schools in 1954, the initial reaction is no way in hell, you know, no, you know not, not, not over my dead body. You know? um, and so initially there's just total resistance, massive resistance, the story that you know relatively well. But then by the, there, there are, a, a much less well-known story is that there are people in the South, including segregationists, um, there were segregationists in the South who, even before the Brown decision, had been saying to the governors of Mississippi, there were lawyers who were going to them and saying, governor, all succession of them, we're not going to be able to keep this. You know, we're not going to, separate but equal is not going to, it's not going to stay because it's not equal. You know, it's obviously not equal. And we've been pretending that it's equal and getting away with it because the Supreme Court was just as racist as all of us uh, up until pretty recently. But that's not the case anymore. Uh, and we're, we're gonna lose uh, if we don't have, if, if equal doesn't become equal. Uh, and so in the beginning in the late 40s and into the 50s, Southern states begin these enormous equalization programs. If you look at the budget of a, of a southern state government today, you'll still see in most of them there'll be a budget allotment for equalization, equalization funds. And the, and the beginning of that, that was the, we got to make things equal. And that's when the southern states started paying for, like all of the black teachers you saw in the film, uh, well, there weren't, there weren't graduate programs in all sorts of disciplines that uh, that at a school in Mississippi that a black person could attend. There were colleges they could attend, but there weren't graduate programs in most, most disciplines. And so the state of Mississippi said, well, we're not gonna start a in school of whatever just for African Americans, so we'll pay for you to go to school wherever you want to in America. And so you had all of these incredibly qualified African American teachers and graduates who you know, went to Michigan or Michigan State or you know, wherever in the country on the tab of the state of Mississippi because they're trying to equalize. And they started building new black schools and all these kinds of things. But so the, uh, 
But so then the Brown decision comes down, then there's still this massive resistance nonetheless, and, and another 10 years goes by, and still there are these people who, there are voices in the South, nobody's hearing them really, but that are coming in and saying, look, it's still not gonna hold. I mean, we're not, this is not gonna work. Massive resistance is not gonna work. And so finally you get to the late 60s, and this happened in our town, in, in Leland. There begin to be people saying, okay, let's figure out how to do it. You know, let's actually try to do it. Let's figure out how to, we're gonna have to integrate the schools. Let's figure out how to do it. And these plans began to be put together uh, that initially were approved by the courts in a lot of places, by lower courts, uh, that called for a gradual desegregation of schools um, that, uh, and a great additional expenditure of resources. There were actually a lot of pretty thoughtful plans uh, that came together in the late 60s. But by then, the opportunity had been frittered away. And if, the, if those sorts of things had begun in 1955, you know, if they had started 15 years earlier, uh, then they might well have worked. We might have a very different country. And so what I would, so my answer to your question then is that somehow we've got to, uh, we've got to reset the clock. Uh, we have to sort of bring ourselves back to uh, a moment where we have to be a little more honest with ourselves about to what degree are we still blindly resisting uh, things that could in fact be done. And a lot of that boils down to, people don't like to hear this, but you don't pay enough in taxes. None of us pay enough in taxes, no matter what we think. We don't pay enough in taxes. Uh, we starve our public schools, uh, and, the, and we do that everywhere. Uh, and, and that ba very basic thing is we've got to change on that. We, we spend less on public schools than almost any developed country in the world, uh, and, that's a, and that is at the very heart of a lot of this. But we've, we've got to go back to, uh, to a, we have to accept that the problem is still bigger than we want to believe, uh, just like they didn't, they wouldn't accept that. Many people wouldn't accept that in 1970. And we've got to challenge that in ourselves now. Question, question over here. So I want to go back to the private schools in Mississippi. I'm fascinated by this idea that they came about in order for white students to avoid going to school with black students. Um, so I'm curious about whether or not there is acceptance within those private schools in Mississippi today regarding their role in segregation that exists today and whether or not there's any admission you talked about being one of the good white students understandably and there was animosity between the white students at the private school versus the white students at the public school is there any re recognition at those schools today that they play seemingly quite a large role in the separation between black students and white students yeah yeah no, it's, it's a very interesting territory. Uh, there is some recognition of that, um, but it is very difficult to find anybody who really will talk about that in an honest way. Uh, in fact, I'm still not sure that we, in the, it, it, one, one of the things I'm still trying to do in the, so we're still shooting stuff for the film, uh, and, uh, and, and that is a group of people that, whose voices I, I feel like we still don't have strong enough. Um, partly because uh, it is very difficult, even the majority of white people who, who put their kids into those schools and whose children, whose, and now those kids who came up from those schools, if they're still somewhere in the South, they're sending their kids to those schools. That's still largely the case. Um, very few of those folks uh, are, are, have a, the, a level of self-awareness like you, as you were just describing. But there's some. There's some consciousness of that. Uh, and uh, like I've had some long conversations with people off camera who, have, who won't talk about it on camera because they don't, they don't want to be seen on camera sort of accepting that, yeah, what we did was wrong, uh, was a bad thing. I'm still working on a couple of those folks uh, uh, to try to bring them in, and, which is a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to get anybody, you know, get somebody to, uh, uh, to, to wrestle with that. But, the, uh, uh, but, but there is some of that. And of course, the other thing that has happened is that uh, those schools are not all white anymore. Uh, and you now have this, you know, the, again, these layers and layers of irony. Uh, you now have that the school that, uh, that white kids in Leland, in my town, go to now, it's not the one in the town. That one, because in the end, that was economically unsustainable. You couldn't have, uh, in, a, in a tiny town that had a tiny public school system, you couldn't have a second school system and support it. So what happened over time was that those schools uh, withered the smaller ones and they combined 
uh, and over time, so now you have a, uh, a pretty large, substantial private school in the next in a larger town, 10 or 15 miles away, that serves a very large geographic area. And so that's a viable school, and it's a pretty good school. You know, it, you know they, 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 it's a reasonably good school. Uh, and is the equal, probably, or close to the equal, maybe even better, uh, than the public high schools that are still in all these different towns. And now that private school, because it's a reasonably good school, because it, does, it doesn't have any of the problems that come with, with uh, having a student population that is overwhelmingly at the poverty level. You know, so that's what a lot of these public schools are now. And so, well, this private school uh, that doesn't have any of those issues or complications, well, that's attractive to the black doctor in the town. You know, there wasn't a black doctor in 1970, but now there is. You know, and there's a black lawyer, and, and there's some black teachers, and the uh, and so some of their kids are are at that are also at this the school, and they may feel bad about it, or they may not. You know, uh, and there's some black athletes at these schools. You know, and that kind of thing. But so so there is a tiny number of uh, uh, there's a tiny bit of diversity. And if the headmaster of a school like that will talk to you, which they once would, but they won't anymore, uh, the uh, you know they would say, "Oh, we're we're not we're not segregated. You know, we desegregated long ago." And they'll be referring to you know the the one black kid who started coming to their school in 1984, and, and now they're four or five. Uh, you know, and uh, but but that's a that is an area that uh, people are still, uh, for the most part, unable to uh, to really reckon with. And I, the last thing I'll say, I'm a uh, I don't know if this will make any sense or not, but after, you know, we've been shooting this film, I've been working on it for five years now, you know, the film itself, uh, and following people through a lot of experiences and kids who were in the high school, in the class that graduated 30 years after my class. And, uh, and one day after we'd been shooting for a couple of days back in Mississippi, and, I, and my, I, should, I should have already said, by the way, that my main collaborator in this project is a brilliant African-American filmmaker named Sam Pollard. Uh, who also together we made the Slavery by Another Name film, and but uh, Sam is uh, one of the most prolific document documentarians in the country, uh, and is a partner of Spike Lee and his feature films, but just incredibly brilliant uh, filmmaker, and uh, and Sam and teaches at NYU, lives in New York, but uh, but Sam and I had just finished this long day of shooting, and I turned around to Sam and I said, you know, everybody in the state of Mississippi is suffering from post-traumatic stress syndrome. Uh, and I really mean that, you know, that, the, uh, that you're, uh, if you grew up there and had bad things happen to you, then okay, that's an obvious version of it. But if you grew up there and were around bad things happening to other people, then you're carrying around this post-traumatic stress syndrome. If you tried to do the right thing, but now you look around and you see things didn't turn out the way that they should have, well, you're, then that's a kind of trauma of its own. If you resisted all the right things, which most white people did, um, then you, whether you're willing to say it or not now, you know it was wrong. You know? Uh, and, and, there are people, and so if you were like my mom and dad's friends who did the wrong thing, and it was the wrong thing, it might be sort of understandable why they did it, but it was the wrong thing. They do know today that it was the wrong thing. Uh, and they know that it's why their town died, you know, uh, which it basically has. Uh, and so, but getting people to come to terms with all of those levels of trauma and be able to confront that in an honest, constructive sort of way is a very complicated thing. You'll have to watch the film in the fall of 2019 when it, when it comes out on PBS uh, and, uh, and see if we answer your question. You know, the film is not done. The film is not written and completed. Uh, and the story here, is not complete. It's not written either. Uh, this is a story that's been going on for 350 years, and uh, I'll tell you, it's not going to stay the same. It's going to get worse, or it's going to get better, and that depends on us. Uh, this is not a Vermont problem. It's not. We are not immune from the challenges of this nation or this world. Um, some of you students in this room, some of you, are going to live the, into the 20. Uh, Second century, right? You're going to live into the year 20, 2100 and something. And that world's going to be very different than it is now. And uh, um, what, how, what it looks like is in large part up to us. I want to interrupt you just for one second. So, among the students who are here, how many of you are juniors? All right, yeah, okay, a ton of you. Well, the, I just want to make sure that you picked up on this. 
Uh, in the in the clips, the the woman you heard, who's not, her, her name was on the screen briefly for a second, Alice Rourke McKee, but uh, who was talking about the walkout, the one white girl who participated in the walkout. Well, she was a junior in high school when she did that. You know, she was the same age as all of you. And if you could follow all of it uh, in these clips, not all the details are there, you know, but uh, she was the one white kid who joined that walkout. She had an older sister who graduated that year and who was of similar persuasion to her. And she was, of course, in 1968-69, Alice was uh, an extraordinarily beautiful flower child, you know, of 1968. You know, she was this, this uh, the archetypal, uh, uh, flower child of that time, and, and you can see, you can picture her, uh, you know, that version of her in that scene. But uh, every time I hear her, I'm doing it now, I, I choke up on the, the bravery of that young woman. Uh, now, the, now, the black kids who walked out were no less brave, uh, but, you know, her decision to do that on the fly led to the virtually the complete destruction of her family. You know, the, you know, she, you know, they, you know, they get the loan called in their house. They get driven out of town, you know, the, uh, and the, and she then, the day that we taped that, that was the first time she had returned, not just to the school, but to the town since May of 19, 70 when she at the end of that school year she gets on a plane she had saved up money that she had been paid singing in the choir at the synagogue in the next town over uh, and she had saved up her money and she had three hundred dollars and she bought a plane ticket uh, to LA and she flew out to California to spend the summer away from all of this with uh, somebody that they knew uh, there and then at the end of the summer she called her dad who had moved to Texas by then and said uh, I'm not coming back uh, and uh, and then she finished high school in California, went to you know went to college out there, became a physician actually, you know, uh, got married, had kids, became a doctor, ended up someplace else. And that day that we shot that was the first time she'd ever gone back to into the scene What's of those events. Alice McKee, Alice Roark McKee. Uh, well, let's thank her for her bravery and thank Doug Blackman for her. Applause.